So my interest over the last two and a half years has really been in fat in ponies and fat in horses. And what happens to the fat when we change the level of diet? So if we start with a thin animal and we allow that, add a little bit of access to food and let that fatten up over weeks and months, where does the fat get laid down? Does it lay down in different places first or does it lay down in all different places at the same time? And then having fattened up those animals, we can then restrict their dietary intake and try and slim them down again and see well now that we've got them fat when we try and take away that energy supply and they have to use their own fat stores do some of those fat stores get used up first do some um, stay there till the very end how does how do the different fat depots actually contribute to the energy needs of the animal now, I suppose I better tell you up front that I've ended up with more questions now than I had at the beginning because I don't think we've really got the answers, but it's a very, very complex field. When we talk about fat being in different sites in these animals, you may hear the word fat patterning or fat partitioning. And that's just a very fancy scientist speak for, we don't all lay down fat in the same place and we don't lay it down beautifully evenly all over the body. And in horses and ponies, their favourite sites for laying down fat are the neck crest, I'm sure you're aware of that, the withers, and the little part behind the shoulder that I'm going to just wobble very gently on Millie here. I sometimes liken that to bingo wings in people. Now that's a little bit unfair because that's because I don't play, you know, tennis or things like that anymore. So mine's flabby muscle, but it's quite a useful place to try and wobble, as I'm sure Teresa will have told you, in, in horses and ponies, to see if we've got a build-up of fat behind the shoulder there. And then as we feel over the ribs, you'll often feel a build-up of fat. You can't feel the bony boom, 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 of the ribs as you feel down the side of the chest. And then over the rump, we'll start seeing this lovely apple shape start appearing, a little bit of a gutter down the back. And over the tail head, sometimes you'll see this kind of donut of fat appearing around there. Now, when we do body condition scoring, we look and we feel from the outside of the animal. That's all very well, but what we don't know is, well, hang on, what's going on inside the animal? We, we can't put our fingers inside her belly and say, well, hang on, she's got this much fat around her stomach or this much fat around her kidneys. And what we do know in horses and ponies is they have this kind of leaf of fat just inside the belly wall that can usually comprise about a third of the total body fat. But we can't actually access that when we fat score or body condition score them. And not all animals are equally fat on the outside and on the inside so by thinking well we've got this equalish partitioning between inside and outside so body condition score can't be that far out we've had a one little welsh section a pony that was fairly lean on the outside but had heaps of fat inside her belly which really surprised us so quite what it was doing there how long it had been there whether she'd ever been super obese in her life and we just missed that and that was the the, the fat pad that just didn't want to go as I say, we have so many different questions that we can't really answer. So one of the problems with trying to do an external appraisal is we don't know what's going on inside. And it can be very confusing with horses and ponies at grass because they often look quite big bellied because of these grass bellies. And it's difficult to know, well, mm, how much of that is just gut fill and how much of that is fat. And if you're armed with a tape measure, you can certainly keep a track and do serial measurements of, of belly girth. But how helpful is that for you when you don't really know if it's just gut fill or whether there's changes in that fat? So if we can't really get a good handle on how much fat she's got by doing a body condition score, how can we measure how much fat is in her body? Well, if she was a dog or a cat, we'd send her to the small animal vets, they'd sedate her and put her on a DEXA scanner. Now, you may or may not have heard of the, the DEXA scan. It's a dual energy X-ray absorptiometry. We seem to like to produce very, very long words. But that's just a very fancy name for a type of scanner that um, sends energy, uh, uh, photons of different energy through the body. And depending on how much of those are absorbed, we can give you a value to say what your bone density is, what your muscle density is, and how much fat's in your body. Now, usually for old ladies, and I'm getting there quickly, they'll be telling me whether I've got osteoporosis soon. But while they're doing that, they can also tell me how much fat I've got. And they can image that picture as a little bit like a whole body x-ray to tell me where my fat is. And for me, it's probably mainly around my hips and my bottom because I'm a lady. But unfortunately, we can't get horses and ponies on a DEXA scanner because the table isn't really big enough. We'd need to anaesthetise them and that has enough um, risk issues for horses and ponies anyway, but they just won't fit. So that is a technology that's not available to us and probably won't be. So we have to find another thing to do. 
And in the meanwhile, the best thing we have is to use ultrasound to try and image under her skin and inside her belly. So you may think, well, what have sound waves got to do? How do we use sound waves to measure fat? Well, we use an ultrasound machine with various different kinds of probes. And today I've just got one that has what we call a linear array probe. So it's a straight line of little crystals. And when we excite these crystals with an electric current, they jiggle around and vibrate. And they produce very high frequency sound waves. And if we make them produce those sound waves in pulses, then in between those pulses of noise, if you like, that we can't hear, the quiet times is when those crystals wait to hear echoes. So when we bombard tissues with ultrasound waves, we wait a little while and see if anything's reflected and comes back. And if waves come back and hit those crystals again, it'll make them wobble again, and this time generate an electric signal that we can then use to display an image on a screen. So different tissues have different characteristics, and it's usually the density or how fibrous that tissue is that helps it reflect the waves. 